Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Hackett and I am the wildlife specialist here uh, at Knox Stonewater Conservation District. Um, I am here talking today about uh, identifying Ohio snakes. Um, I've spent uh, a good deal of um, my formative years in education uh, starting uh, freshman year of high school working with um, state herpetologists doing uh, snake work uh, in various parts of the state, um, typically focusing on endangered species like the Eastern Plains garter snake, the timber rattlesnake, and the Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, we would go out and do field work, um, collect data, um, and sometimes uh, tag and uh, be able to uh, track and, and record data on individual species as well and individual animals. Um, that really uh, sparked a lot of my interest in, in snakes and, and uh, working in conservation, uh, working with wildlife. Um, and I continued that all through college um, and pursuing my degree and, and obviously my career as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so why bother knowing uh, you know, what snake is what? Why bother? Uh, understanding, you know, if this is a, a garter snake or uh, a brown snake or a queen snake or, or a massasauga rattlesnake. Um, well, a big one with that last one is 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 knowing what snakes uh, could possibly be dangerous to people, uh, whether it's uh, your pets, your kids, um, and knowing which ones are harmless and uh, which ones, you know, you can. Um, not be afraid of and um, not have to worry about if they're, they're around your garden or around your home. Um, typically, they're just there to, to eat and, and keep your home as pest free as, as they can. Um, that is obviously a, a, big, um, a big reason to know snake ID um, or at least be familiar with it. Another reason is if somebody does get bitten by a snake, um, being able to identify whether it was venomous or not um, can definitely help save that person's life um, if they do end up needing to go to a hospital and get uh, antivenine um, to, to counteract the venom if it was a, a venomous bite. Um, another big reason is uh, understanding what role they play in the ecosystem. Uh, snakes are really big contributors to your local ecosystems uh, here in Ohio as well as throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, snakes play a very big role uh, as both uh, a top predator and prey um, within their, their individual ecosystems. Um, so they definitely play a big role in regulating um, rodent populations, um, sometimes insect, you know, insect populations. They can reduce vectors uh, for diseases and things like that. Um, and as I said, you know, they can be uh, prey items for um, animals higher up on the food chain, such as hawks, owls, um, foxes, coyotes, um, bobcats, things like that. So um, they really play a, a very valuable role uh, in their ecosystems. Um, plus, it's just fun and snakes are cool. So take the time to learn about them and appreciate them. Um, hopefully you'll think so, too. So starting off, um, some snake basics, uh, as you can see there, um, there's a, over 3,500 species worldwide, which is quite a few. Um, the colubrids are going to be your largest species or largest family of snakes. Um, that They represent about half. Um, most of them are constrictors, but there are a few uh, venomous species within that group. Um, they're all rear fanged, which means that their fangs lie towards the back of their mouth as opposed to the front fanged uh, cobras and things like that, which are much more uh, well known. Uh, boas and pythons are the oldest and most primitive of the snake species. Um, some of them can even bear the vestigial limbs of when snakes actually did have legs uh, and they evolved to, to live without them. Um, basically doing what they do uh, and, and being able to e easily go inside burrows and chase after um, 
rodents and things like that. Um, Alapids and vipers are the biggest uh, venomous species uh, groups. Uh, your your lapids are are going to incorporate your cobras, um, your vipers, your viperidae is going to obviously uh, be all your pit vipers, your rattlesnakes, and things like that. My picture here, so you can read the rest of that, uh, stuff written down there, but. Yeah, elapids have uh, front fixed fangs, um, uh, usually neurotoxic venom, usually affecting the nervous system of, and, and causing paralysis um, of their, their intended prey. Um, vipers have hinged fangs, which means they, when they go to strike, they actually fold out, um, versus elapids they are fixed in one position. Uh, vipers usually have a hemotoxic venom, which is a, uh, a venom that has toxins that affect the blood cells. Um, so they attack the blood cells, cause hemorrhaging um, of the internal organs, and, and typically, um, you know, that is what causes death in, in their uh, prey. Um, both are um, very well known, uh, probably some of the, make up some of the most well known snakes that people know about and are afraid of. Um, subsequently, subsequently. Um, but as we'll get to later on, um, you'll figure out and you'll kind of see, you know, that uh, a lot of people's fears of snakes, um, even the venomous ones, uh, is a little bit, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit on, uh, on the unnecessary side because, um, you know, they, they really don't pose that big of a threat to, to people. Um, while it is always um, recommended you be cautious if you're in a known um, you know, snake habitat, you know, especially when there's um, known venomous species in the area, uh, you definitely want to be cautious. But in the grand scheme of things, um, they're not one of the biggest things to worry about or, or really even be afraid of. So. so jumping into Ohio snakes now, um, we're going to kind of narrow down to just our, the Buckeye State here. Um, we have 25 species here in Ohio. Uh, six feet is about the length, the typical average length of a female uh, gray rat snake. Also, many people know as a black rat snake or a midland rat snake. They've undergone uh, numerous um, changes to their taxonomy uh, over the last 15, 20 years or so. Um, now referred to as the gray rat snake. Um, but the longest individuals in Ohio have been of this species, and they can reach up to eight feet long, um, which is a decent size. Um, that's the, the snake you see there pictured on the, the right. Um, 14 of Ohio's 25 species, so over half, uh, don't exceed two feet when they're full grown. So most of our snakes are pretty small. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people see a full grown uh, decays brown snake or queen, queen snake and think it's just a baby. No, that's actually how big they get. Uh, as you see to the right there, the person handling a, a queen snake, that's its adult size. Um, they don't get any bigger than that. Uh, so not all snakes, definitely not all snakes are, are big uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, most of them actually are pretty small. Uh, we have three venomous species here in Ohio, and we'll get to those. Um, all of our non-venomous snakes are colubrids, as I talked about earlier, and all of our venomous species are vipers. Um, which means they all belong to that family, Viperidae. Um, they are all pit vipers. Uh, we have two rattlesnakes and then the copperhead. Uh, we have five state-listed um, species here in, in Ohio, five snakes that five snake species that are listed as endangered. Um, and some of those are we have to both they include both the rattlesnakes. Um, they include uh, your Eastern Plains garter snake, which is um, relegated to a pretty small area there in uh, kind of the north central part of the state. Uh, and then there's a couple others that are typically found more further up north um, around Lake Erie. So the first part of our ID um, 
is going to be knowing where you are. Um, obviously, we're right there, as you can see. But all jokes aside, know where you are. It's also useful for not getting lost. Um, biomes and habitats are going to be your first key um, to identifying a snake that you may find or, or know what snakes are, are going to be out there or around you um, if you're in a certain area. Uh, so when you go into a biome, say you're hiking or camping or, you know, outdoor in, outdoor recreating of any sort, um, knowing what kind of snakes are, are in that biome or like to live, prefer that kind of habitat, will go a long way into being able to identify a snake if you see one. Um, pretty much all snakes prefer a specific kind of biome. Um, you can pretty much kind of rule out uh, a good chunk of snakes if you're in this kind of uh, habitat versus this kind of habitat. Um, there's also species that look a lot like one another that you can rule one out because they prefer to be in the woods and you're in the middle of a grass field, um, that kind of thing. So knowing your biomes, knowing your habitats, being able to differentiate between scrubland and desert, um, coniferous, deciduous forests, swamps, wetlands, and bogs, um, things like that will go a long way to, uh, to being able to know what kind of snakes you're going to be around. So I set up here a little kind of a uh, little, little uh, game, but, um, you know, knowing where you're at, you know, if you're in a residential garden there, um, you may find the decays brown snake. Uh, so the decays brown snake is a very, very common snake here in Ohio. Um, one of the most common, I would say, uh, that people uh, oftentimes see and send me pictures of and ask what it is. Um, they often think it's a, a baby snake. It's one of those little guys. Um, adults rarely get over a foot and a half. Um, they stay very small. They eat slugs, earthworms, things like that, mollusks. Um, small things like that run around in your garden. And, you know, they're just kind of there as free pest control. So these guys are actually nice to have around, uh, completely harmless um, little guys, and, and they're really cute. Uh, you know, if you do come across one in your garden, um, just kind of observe them and, and let them be on their way because they're there helping you uh, keep your plants nice and, nice and pretty. Um, but say you're out in the, you know, a deciduous forest, a uh, forested landscape like this. Uh, you come across this guy. Looks an awful lot like that decays brown snake. However, because of the type of biome you're in, because of the type of habitat, um, if you come across one of these guys, it's much more likely to be a smoother snake out here than in your garden. These guys you would never find in your garden. I shouldn't say never, but it'd be very rare um, to find one, find one there. So uh, knowing where you're at, can distinguish, you know, uh, two species that look an awful lot like each other. Um, something similar here, if you're in a prairie or meadow, you might come across uh, what a lot of people consider is Ohio's prettiest snake, the smooth green snake, um, versus if you're in a deciduous forest, uh, you may see his look-alike, um, the rough green snake. Uh, these guys are more slender, uh, they have keeled scales as opposed to the smooth scales of the smooth green snake, where they get their name. It's very inventive. Um, but that, see, but you can tell kind of how that, knowing what kind of biome you're in can distinguish between um, those kind of very similar species. So your next part of kind of beginning snake ID uh, is going to be knowing your parts of the snake. So. Um, knowing what to look for differentiating wise uh, in the markings um, and things like that. Um, so first off, a lot of snakes, uh, when, you're, when you're reading field guides and things like that, um, a lot of them talk about certain markings on the face, um, on certain scales, things like that. Um, so kind of having some familiarity with um, uh, you know, where those certain scales are, uh, kind of sort of what they're called, um, 
you know, can definitely help you a lot, especially if you're using a field guide or something like that to try to ID a snake that you find. Um, but as you can see there, I'll move my, my picture here. Um, as you can see there on the diagram, um, you've got groups of scales on the snake's face that are called different things. You've got the labials, the upper and the lower, which are the, the scales above its mouth and below its mouth. Um, you've got the scales under its chin, which are the chin shields. Uh, you've got the oculars around its eyes. Um, and then you've got the superoculars, which are above the eyes. Uh, temporals, which is like basically our temple. Uh, it kind of sits behind their eye there. You can kind of remember that one. The nasal scales are up by its nose. Um, so the names are, are make sense. Um, but knowing knowing some of those, um, you know what they're what they're kind of called, uh, will definitely help you read some of those field guides, and will also help you um, with the with the idea of the snake. So starting out here, we've got a couple of Ohio's garter snakes. Uh, we have the common garter and we have the Eastern Plains garter, uh, one of the endangered species that I was talking about. Um, besides some color differences, um, which there are some, uh, a big differentiating factor between our garter snakes is where that lateral stripe is. So that lateral stripe is the one that's on the side uh, the dorsal stripe is the one that's on the back. Um, dorsal stripes on the eastern plains are usually kind of more orangish red uh, versus the common garters are a yellow. Um, but the lateral stripes on the common garter are usually like the second and third row above the belly scales. So kind of counting up from the belly scales, you can kind of see uh, they sit a lot closer to the belly. They sit further down on the snake, basically, um, versus the Eastern Plains garter, that yellow stripe sits at the third and fourth row. So it sits a little bit higher. It sits about midway, midway through the, the snake's body. And then you've got our Eastern Ribbon Snake, which is another snake here in Ohio. Um, it is not called a garter snake, but it is uh, cousin of the garter snakes and very uh, closely related. Um, looks pretty similar. Um, a big indicating factor for the ribbon snake is its tail. Uh, their tails are very, very long. Um, they can be upwards of a third of their body length. Um, and yes, snakes do have tails. You can see on the diagram there. Um, the On the underside of the snake, um, you have the cloaca or the anal scale, um, and that's the, where the snake goes to the bathroom, it spells excrement, excrement. Um, everything from the cloaca down to the tip of the, the tail is the tail. Uh, everything up to the cloaca is the belly. Uh, another huge, uh, indicating factor, um, and, and this is used in field guides and things like that, is uh, whether the scales are smooth or keeled. Um, if they are keeled, they can be called heavily keeled, or moderately keeled, or slightly keeled, uh, or smooth. So keeled scales refers to um, basically that, that line that you can see going down the middle of the scale. It's like a, it's raised up, it's like a bump. Uh, if you could look at a cross section of that scale, um, it would kind of, it would have like a little peak on it uh, versus the smooth scale is of course smooth. Um, so the scales there on the, the left, I would call heavily keeled. Uh, so the degree of keeledness kind of refers to how pronounced that, that ridge is in the center of the scale. Um, and depending on the snake species, it can vary um, quite a bit. Um, so, with that being said, we'll move on to Ohio snake species. Um, not that kind of snake, uh, though we don't like them. But uh, this part of my PowerPoint is actually uh, set up to correlate to 
uh, the Division of Wildlife's uh, Reptiles of Ohio field guide. Um, usually I pass these out, but if you do have one, feel free to kind of follow along. Uh, the snakes start on page 24. Um, we'll start there with the, the queen snake. Uh, you can kind of go in order there with me uh, if, you, if you happen to have that book. Um, so our first snake is the, the queen snake. Um, and these cute little guys are uh, a, a very aquatic species, um, typically always found around or near or in water. Um, like the, the uh, size up there says it's the smallest water snake, they stay very small. Only Adults only get about a foot long, a little bit longer than a foot, foot and a half long. Um, you can usually find them under rocks and things like that, but in like dam spillways and, and places like that. Um, they're not super hard to find, um, but people don't see them all that often because they are pretty secretive. They do like to hide, you know, being, you know, being as small as they are, they can make a, a quick meal for a lot of different things. So, um, but they do feed on, they'll feed on crayfish, they'll feed on small fishes, uh, insect larvae, things like that. Um, and as you can see there, they kind of have that olive green body um, with that cream stripe right below their belly. So they do have keeled skin as well. Uh, our next snake is a curtain snake. Um, and these guys are really pretty, um, but they are uh, they are declining in their population. Uh, their numbers are they're pretty uh, rare to find. So if you do find one, consider yourself lucky. Uh, they are listed as threatened right now in the state, um, but typically found throughout the glaciated western part of Ohio and kind of wet meadows, prairies, things like that. Um, they primarily eat earthworms and soft bodied insects, like a lot of our small snakes do. Um, the dorsal scales, as you can see there, have four rows of dark spots on a reddish, kind of reddish uh, amber background. Um, and one of the easiest identifying features, if we flip them over there, as you can see on this guy, they have that bright red belly with the two uh, vert vertical rows of scales going down, or vertical rows of spots going down each side of their scales, uh, which is a good differentiating feature from another snake that we have here in Ohio. That one later on. Um, next up is the northern water snake. Um, these are one of the most common snakes in Ohio, um, probably the number one snake that I get sent pictures of, um, people asking me to ID it. Um, they are oftentimes confused with uh, cotton mouths, which we don't have here in Ohio, but they're also confused. They can be, you know, they can, they can look like quite a bit. Um, they're dark, um, dark snake usually found around ponds, uh, lakes, reservoirs, streams, rivers, um, really any kind of body of water, um, even even wet uh, bogs, marshes, and kind of in ephemeral ponds and stuff like that, wet woods. Um, they are pretty temperamental, though they're completely harmless, and they do get pretty big. Um, as you can see there, they can, they can get up about 42 inches long, um, which is just, just shy of four feet. Um, so yeah, as you can see there, almost any kind of permanent body of water, stream, river, um, you usually see them on the, the edge, basking on logs. Um, they eat primarily fish, frogs, uh, they will eat crayfish too if you find them in the river. Um, they can range uh, widely in their coloration. Um, the more southern water snakes are, have a lot more bands on them, as you can kind of see on this guy. He's got that kind of banded pattern to him. Uh, while the northern water snakes, uh, because it doesn't get as hot up there, uh, the sun's not quite as intense, they're typically a lot darker in pigmentation to try to absorb more of that sun. Um, so the, the Lake Erie water snake um, can appear almost black. Uh, a good indicator for these guys, as you can see really nice and distinctly on this, uh, this guy here, is his bands on the upper labials that continue down to the lower label. You see those kind of stripes that almost look like his mouth sewn shut or something like that. 
Uh, they almost look like sutures going across his mouth. That is a, a very good um, distinctive feature to look for uh, when you're trying to ID a, a water snake from uh, any other kind of snake here in Ohio. Here's uh, one of our state endangered species, the copper plain bellied water snake. Um, really, you can only find them up. Uh, Williams County around uh, around Lake Erie right now. Um, the range is pretty restricted um, in this state. They like those kind of marshes, wetlands, and swampy woodlands around around Lake Erie. Um, they spend a lot more time on land than the the northern water snake, the one we just previously previously talked about. Uh, but again, they feed on fish and frogs, um, prey that they can find pretty easily around the those kind of habitats that they live in. Um, they're almost a solid matte black uh, on top, but they have that uh, characteristic labial bands that, that water snakes have that we just talked about. And they also have that bright reddish copper, orangish colored uh, chin extending all the way down their belly, uh, which is a very easily, easily detected and, and noticeable ID feature for them. Here's our cute little garden snake again. Uh, it decays brown snake. These guys, uh, like I said before, uh, very common throughout the state. Um, you can find them in residential gardens pretty often. You can find them just about anywhere, forests, woodland edges, uh, floodplains. Um, they like to eat slugs, snails, and earthworms, a lot of soft-bodied insects again. Um, if you're noticing a trend there, that's most of our, our small snakes are, are feeding on those kinds of, of insects. Uh, they can be ID'd. ID they're just a, that kind of light brown color with uh, two rows of dark spots going down their dorsal. Um, so they've got those, you can see there on this guy, uh, they've got those dark spots going down the each side of their back. Um, they also have, which you can't see on this guy, they have two uh, black neck spots kind of right behind their head. But very common to find here in the state. Uh, as I talked about earlier with the Kirtland snake, um, the red-bellied snake looks a lot like it, and it looks a lot like the uh, decays brown snake that we just talked about. Um, a good ID fe feature between it and the decays brown snake is it does not have those dark spots on it. Uh, and a good ID feature that differentiate it between the Kirtland snake is if you flip it over, you see that red belly, it does not have those uh, two vertical lines of spots going down each side. Um, so those are all good differentiating features. Uh, this is another one of our little snakes. Um, it's <coughs> Uh, it's very secretive, uh, found in moist forests, wet meadows, and, and bogs, and things like that, mostly on the eastern part of the state, mostly on the, ungla the glaci unglaciated part, um, where we still have a lot of old growth deciduous forests and things like that. Um, and not many people find these guys because uh, they are so small and they, they're pretty secretive. So, But again, they feed on the slugs, the snails, and the earthworms there that they can find. And um, they can be easily identified by that bright red belly. So next up is a, a eastern hognose snake, um, and, and this could be uh, argued as as being one of the uh, the most interesting snakes here in the state. Um, these guys are really cool. Uh, they get their name from kind of an up, upturned nose that they have there that they use for rooting uh, and digging and things like that. Um, they'll actually root out and dig up buried frogs, uh, which is one of their favorite things to eat. Um, but these guys are known for their dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, shows and displays if uh, they feel threatened. Um, which we'll get to here in a second, but they're they're found in a, a variety of habitats with sandy soils. Um, you 
can find them a lot up kind of, you know, as you get closer to Lake Erie, uh, up in the, the northern part of the snake, the, the state. Um, oak openings, which is kind of that area around uh, Toledo, south of Toledo, uh, northwestern Ohio, and then the unglaciated part of southern Ohio, where you get some of those hilly areas uh, with some sandy soil. Uh, as I stated, it uh, uses that upturned snout to root out toads, um, which it loves to eat. And typically it has a pretty variable color pattern, uh, but the one you see pictured here is, is pretty uh, is pretty normal or pretty typical um, for them. Usually it's kind of a, a brown, brownish black uh, with a blotched pattern, field scales, uh, alternating dark spots on either side of the body. Um, as I said, they, you know, they're a master of theatrics. They, they're the, uh, the drama geeks of, of the snake world. Uh, when they feel threatened, they flatten their neck out and try to look like a cobra. And if that doesn't work, they start hissing real loud and they'll strike violently, uh, but they won't open, they don't strike with their fangs, they strike with their mouth shut. Uh, they're just trying to scare away whatever's scaring them. And if all that doesn't work, they will roll over, hold their, flop their tongue out, uh, defecate, and writhe around on the ground to make it look like they're dying. And then they'll just lay there still as if they, they're dead. And hopefully that dissuades the potential predator or would-be threat. Uh, it's pretty interesting to watch them, watch this little display that they do. Um, but it is very, uh, it's very convincing. Um, they would definitely get a uh, an encore from the audience if they were in a in an actual play. Next up on our list is the smooth earth snake. Um, <clears throat> these guys uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. They can look a little bit like the uh, decays brown snake, um, but again, these guys are really really secretive. Um, very small, uh, almost that solid brown color. They will sometimes have those little dark um, spots on the back. They're very, very small, not nearly as big as the, the dark spots on the decays garter or the decays brown snake. Um, so again, they feed on the earthworms, snails, and slugs that surround on the for, for, forest floor. Um, but yeah, heavy, heavily forested areas. Uh, they stay hidden under leaf litter, rocks, logs, things like that. In the, the southern part of the state. Um, the next guy on our list is the northern ringneck snake. Um, these are no, this is another one of our little snakes here, uh, characteristically defined by that ring right around their neck, where it gets its name. Um, usually their, their scales are kind of a bluish black, kind of a gunmetal blue. Um, they're smooth. They feed on earthworms, uh, salamanders, things like that, um, sometimes small lizards. Um, throughout Ohio, really except the Northwest, but they prefer kind of rocky, wooded hillsides. They like those uh, forest floors and things like that where they can hide under the leaf litter, leaf litter and rocks. Um, but again, easily defined by that, that ring um, that goes around its neck. And then its ventral scales, which are the scales on its belly, are the same color as that ring. Uh, this is a cool little snake we have here um, that is hardly ever seen, if at all, because um, it spends a lot of time under the ground. And it's kind of how it gets its name, the common worm snake. Uh, it looks a lot like a big earthworm. And only gets about 10 inches long when it's fully grown, 8 to 10 inches. Um, found kind of down in the southern southern quarter of Ohio, uh, again in kind of those heavily forested um, hills and things like that. Uh, feeds on earthworms and just kind of like I said stays very secretive, buried under rocks, uh, buried in moist soils, under leaf litter, things like that. Uh, it's got a really flat head that it helps kind of use as a uses almost like a wedge to drive through and, and burrow into the, the soil. 
Uh, next up is one of our bigger state uh, snakes here, and this is actually the, uh, the state reptile, it's the North American racer. Um, there's two subspecies in Ohio. We have the blue and the black racer, um, with the blue racer being found kind of more on the western part of the state and the black racer kind of being found more on the eastern, southern, southeastern part of the state. Um, but a variety of habitats, grassland, pastures, fence rows, woodlands, um, they can really be found just kind of without any habitat here we have in the state. Um, they'll feed on uh, a variety of, of different animals and insects, um, small mammals, other snakes, frogs, lizards, birds, bird eggs, um, really just about anything they can, they can fit in their mouth. Um, as you can see with this guy, they have smooth scales, very smooth looking, uniform kind of matte black on the black ones. The blue racers definitely have a, a bluish cast to them, kind of a gunmetal blue. Uh, their ventral scales, their belly, is uh, white or cream colored. Uh, and these guys, as they get their name, the racer, they are very fast and agile snakes. They will uh, usually be gone before you can even be able to ID them or tell you know, what kind of snake it was. Um, they are also excellent climbers too, so they can climb trees and, and they enjoy climbing trees to seek out birds' nests so they can get those tasty eggs that are inside. Next up is an, another one of our long species here, another one of our big species. Um, the gray rat snake we talked about earlier, they can get uh, the biggest or the longest here in Ohio. Um, they can get, you know, about 72 inches. I think eight feet is the, the max, uh, the record size. That, um, but usually, you know, they're about in the six foot range. Um, so a decent sized snake. Um, they're, they can sometimes be temperamental and sometimes be uh, fairly calm when you when you encounter them. It just kind of depends on the snake and how it's feeling that day. Um, but they are harmless and they're excellent at catching rats and mice and other uh, small rodents that may be running around your house or your barn or anything like that. Um, it inhabits pretty much any kind of forest statewide. Uh, it loves to climb. Um, you can all, uh, a common joke is rat snakes get in predicaments. Um, they often climb so well that they find themselves precariously placed in, in certain areas on homes or, or barns or things like that. Um, as I said before, um, they have gone on under a few different taxonomy changes here the last few years. So they used to be called the black rat snake and the midland rat snake. Um, but a big uh, distinction with the racers is they're not, they don't have that uniform uh, matte blackness to them. They do have uh, a, kind of a faint dorsal pattern to them. Uh, you can see on this one here a little bit. Um, again, that white cream belly, um, but kind of the patterning on their back will differentiate them from the racer. Uh, next up is the Eastern Fox snake. Uh, these guys are pretty much just found up around Lake Erie. Uh, you don't find them really you don't find them anywhere else in the state. They do get pretty big. Um, I think they're probably the prettiest snake that you can find here in the state. Um, they're really pretty with that uh, kind of orangish tan background and those uh, reddish brown spots that they have there. And those kind of all lead up to their copper uh, or dark orange colored head. Um, but it's very, uh, uh, a very good swimmer, uh, can climb. Uh, but they spend a lot of time in the water, uh, as evidence being, you know, up around Lake Erie. They'll feed on rats, mice, birds, uh, bird eggs, frogs, um, just about anything they can find there. And they do get, uh, you know, they get pretty good size, four to uh, four to five feet or so. The eastern black king snake. Uh, these guys are fascinating snakes. Um, they're one of my favorite snakes. Uh, partially because they are notorious uh, for their immunity to a lot of other snake venom. Uh, so these guys will actually prey upon other snakes, including venomous species. 
which is really cool, and how, how they get their name, King Snake, um, King over the snakes. Um, they, they really like to eat uh, other snakes as well as small mammals, lizards, and birds. Um, their, bat, their body is usually black with that kind of speckling color on it, uh, you see on this one. Uh, but yeah, smooth, shiny scales. They can get pretty long, but they're more slender typically than a black rat or a racer. Um, they don't get quite the girth on them, but they will get the length. As you can see, they you know they can get up to um, get up to about six feet or so in length. Uh, but yeah, forests, uh, woodland edges, rocky um, kind of outcrops, river bottoms, stuff like that. Really, in Ohio, you can only find them down in the, the very southern part of the state. Um, you don't see them anywhere else here. Uh, but you can find them other, you know, throughout the United States. Uh, next up is the Eastern Milk Tank. This guy is a, a very common snake in Ohio. Um, this is another one that I get a decent amount of, of people sending me pictures of. Uh, completely harmless. Um, and, uh, the, you know, they're very, they're kind of similar to the black rat snake in terms of their uh, their characteristics and dispositions. Uh, they're usually pretty laid back, um, but people encounter them a lot because they find their way into people's homes uh, in the winter time. Um, but you, in the wild, you usually see them in forests, uh, meadows, river bottoms, really, really just about any kind of habitat. Um, but as you can see there, they do tolerate being in urban areas, uh, so you can see them in backyards, barns, houses, and things like that. Um, they do offer you some free rodent control, uh, so they feed on mice and um, lizards and sometimes other snakes. Uh, but yeah, as you can see there, a good uh, uh, distinguishing feature for them is kind of that Y or V patch. That's right on the back side of their head there. You can see it really good on this guy. Um, that's kind of a unique pattern to these guys that you can look for um, and, and really be able to tell them apart pretty quickly. Uh, but they also, there's uh, not a lot of snakes in Ohio that, that really resemble these guys closely. Um, they have that lighter colored body with those red um, spots going right down their dorsal side, big spots kind of going across like a saddle, and then they've got um, some more smaller red spots um, on their sides, kind of that checkered pattern. So we've already talked about them a little bit, but we'll get into we'll kind of grouped all of Ohio's garter snakes together. Um, and I did that for a reason. Um, <clears throat> so the most common um, probably snake here in Ohio is the, the common garter snake. Um, people see that one all the time. You can find them in your gardens and things like that. Um, that's this guy down on the bottom, center bottom. Um, the Eastern Plains Garter Snake, which is the one over on the left, has that orange dorsal stripe, and they are state endangered. You can only find them in one area of Ohio. Um, and so, so unless you're in that area, they're very, very uncommon. Um, and then the two garter snakes, two species on the right, the Butler's Garter Snake, which is on top, and the Short-Headed Garter Snake, which is on the bottom there. Um, both of them are fairly rare to find here in the state. The butlers you can find more kind of in the northern part of the state around Lake Erie, uh, a little bit more commonly. Uh, and the shorthead, you know, you can only find really in the southern part of the state in only a couple counties. Um, so out of all the garter snake species, uh, if you encounter one in, in the wild, it's most likely, uh, chances are extremely good that it's a common garter snake. Kind of wrap up here with uh, these guys on, um, you know, with the Ohio, Ohio's green snakes. We have two different green snakes. We talked about them earlier, the rough and the smooth green snake. Um, the smooth green snake likes kind of more open prairies and things like that, that kind of habitat. They like being on the ground. Um, smooth scales, they're a very elegant looking snake. Um, whereas the rough green snake has the keeled scales. They're more long and slender, not as stout. Um, and they love climbing trees, and so you usually find them in the, the woodlands and things like that. So they're another one that you can really differentiate 
between those two species just based on their habitat. So we'll play a little game here of, uh, of lookalikes. Um, these are, this is typically kind of when I'm giving this presentation live, uh, I'll have, you know, people kind of try to differentiate and tell them, you know, say it, tell me which is which, um, because these things can be confused with each other quite often. Here's two, two species that look uh, fairly, fairly alike. Um, they're pretty closely related. Um, the one on the left we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, that's your decay's brown snake. The one on the right um, can definitely be confused with this guy. So they typically don't have those dark spots going down their back. And they usually, if you were to flip him over, they would usually have a nice red belly uh, without any kind of spots going down the side. That would be the red belly. And here we again have the red bellied snake flipped over. As you can see that nice bright red belly. And next to him, you have uh, the Kirtland snake, which has those dark spots going down both sides. Uh, a very nice differentiating feature between these two little snakes. Here's two snakes that get commonly confused with each other uh, because they both like water. Uh, however, the one on the left stays considerably smaller than the one on the right. The one on the left is the queen snake, the smallest little water snake we talked about there in the beginning. Um, they have that all over dark, real dark back uh, with just that cream um, striping on the sides, uh, real close to like basically right on top of the belly scales. And then on the right, we have the common garter, um, which does have that kind of black and it's got the cream on the side, but they always have that yellow band, dorsal stripe going down their back. They also get quite a bit bigger than the, the guard, than the queen snake does. Here's two we talked about. Um, we've got the, the North American racer, the black racer on the, the left. Uh, with that deep matte black smooth scales, smooth looking. Um, another good indicator, as you can see on this guy, is the racers have kind of, they they're, they have what people like to sometimes call eyebrows. Um, they've got those, those, basically those brows above their eyes that kind of give them almost a mad look to them. Uh, they're really the, uh, them, the, the hog nose snake can sometimes have those, but hog nose snake isn't black like they are, so. Uh, among black snakes, it's a good kind of feature you can look for. It's those those brows. Uh, and then on the right there, we have the gray rat snake, um, very common snake here in Ohio. Uh, they're they're very, you know, they're mostly black, but they do have, as you can see on this one, some faint uh, patterning to them, um, as opposed to you compare them to the the racer there. Uh, they have a little bit more of that spat that speckling or the, the white. Kind of the lighter colored speckled in there underneath the underneath the black. Um, here's two that that can oftentimes have a very similar pattern, um, kind of that brownish banding. Uh, on the left there, we have the the flattened look of the eastern hognose snake when it feels threatened. It kind of tries to make itself look like a a cobra it makes it tries to tries to make itself look bigger than he is um, to scare off whatever's scaring him. And and then there on the uh, the right we have our northern water snake, which can easily be distinguished by those labial bands that we talked about. Um, but as you can see there, their patterns the patterns on these two snakes can often can depending on where you see them in the state can look very similar. Uh, as we said, you know, the, the, the water snakes that are found down in the southern part of the state are usually a lot more banded than the ones up north. So this snake here, you could probably find down in Cincinnati or, or along the Ohio River, somewhere down in the southern part of the state. Um, versus if you went all the way up to Lake Erie, they, they have much darker appearance. Um, sometimes you can't even see their pattern at all. All right, so the moment 
uh, a lot of you have probably all been waiting for. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the three venomous species here in Ohio. Um, as you can see there, uh, very common uh, mistake here, or mistake made with people talking about uh, venomous snakes as they call them poisonous snakes. And uh, if you remember back to your high school biology class, poisonous, poison is ingested. Uh, so it is when you eat something that is poisonous and that it, the toxins get inside you that way versus something that is venomous, uh, the, the venom is injected. So poison is ingested, venom is injected. Um, that's snakes. All right, Ohio's three. Uh, we've got the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, uh, which is a little pygmy rattlesnake. Uh, it's state endangered. Uh, you can only find it in certain parts of the state, um, but it likes uh, it likes really big uh, open prairies, wetland prairies. Um, believe it or not, it likes to eat crayfish, and then it'll actually eat the crayfish, and then it'll hibernate in their burrows. So how do you like that? If you have a crayfish. Uh, you get eaten and then your home gets stolen. But uh, they do like those kind of wetland prairies, um, those remnant prairie ecosystems that are becoming harder and harder to find in Ohio. Um, and that's part of the reason their populations are, have been in decline is, is just a loss of habitat. Um, the one down in the center there is the timber rattlesnake. That's Ohio's largest venomous species. Um, and they are state endangered as well. You can only find them down in the very southern part of Ohio. They like those old growth deciduous forests, those unglaciated hills uh, where they'll make dens and, and rocky outcroppings and things like that. Um, a very beautiful snake. Um, they typically will come in three different color morphs. They'll have kind of like an orange phase, a brown phase, and a black phase. Um, the, the brown phase one, as you can see here, kind of has those those saddles that go across it, um, and and fading into a dark tail. The black phase one can, as the name says, look almost black, um, and then the orange phase one definitely has a, a orange cast kind of all over. It. It's kind of an amber colored. Um, these are the this is the only snake in Ohio that um, could potentially kill a, a healthy adult person um, if you were bitten by one. Um, they're the only snake that's big enough uh, to, and they, they have enough venom, uh, and their venom is, is toxic enough that they could potentially kill a, an adult. Um, the Eastern Massasauga and the Copperhead, which we'll talk about next, um, they both don't really pose a, a life-threatening threat to a, a healthy adult. Um, you know, if they, a bad bite could definitely put you in the hospital for a few days, um, but most of the time, um, you know, they're, they can't kill you. Um, now, if you're, if you're talking about a small child uh, or, or somebody with a lot of health problems or, or elderly, um, they might have a harder time if, if they were to encounter one of these snakes um, and, and it were to bite them. But um, for the most part, um, the timber rattlesnake is, is really the, the only one that's uh, of much of a lethal threat to, to adults here in Ohio. Um, so lastly, we'll talk about the, the copperhead, as you see there on the right. Um, these guys are well known throughout Appalachia. Uh, they're pretty common. Um, they've got that brown, light brown body with the, the dark brown saddles and then that orangish coppered head. Um, all these snakes, uh, as, I, as I kind of talked about, the Eastern Massasauga really likes crayfish. They'll eat frogs, they'll eat mice, they'll eat small rodents, um, whatever they can, you know, kind of find. Timber rattlesnakes snakes are the same way. They, they target more larger rodents. Um, they can eat something as big as a, you know, a rabbit, a squirrel, uh, rats, mice, things like that. Uh, copperheads are um, typically going after small rodents, chipmunks, uh, mice. Uh, copperheads have also been documented um, feeding on cicadas. Uh, it's one of their preferred meals is actually finding, uh, finding emerging cicadas on trees and things like that um, that they will hunt. 
mistaken identity. So these, uh, the next couple of slides here, I'm talking about a uh, couple of snakes here that I hear a lot about. Um, uh, people come to me a lot uh, with, with questions about these snakes, thinking that they're uh, venomous species. Um, the first one, and the, the, by far and away, the number one snake that I get questions about is the northern water snake here. As you can see pictures when we've talked about it. Um, typically found around water here in Ohio, very common to find. Uh, harmless to people, though they're typically, if you encounter them and if you mess with them or get too close, they can have a pretty uh, irritable personality and they will strike and they will bite and it, it might hurt a little bit, but uh, they, don't, they don't have any venom. Uh, they're a constrictor. Uh, so they don't pose any any threat to people. Um, the good rule of thumb there, those labial bands that you see on the, the upper and lower, lower labials uh, is, is always a great way to identify the uh, the northern water snake here. Um, as well as, you know, if you look at the eyes, uh, it's got those round pupils uh, versus all three of our venomous species here have the uh, cat-like pupils or the, the vertical pupils. Uh, so if you're close enough where you can see its eyes or see its pupils, uh, that's that can be another good way. So that's not a, a tried and true method to, to you know identify all venomous species. Um, there are venomous species other parts of the world that have the circular pupils as well. But here in Ohio, it's safe. Um, and you see down there in the, per the person's hands, that's a that's a immature uh, or a little baby northern water snake. They have kind of that banding. Um, they're, they're real dark and they have those kind of white bands on them. These guys are often mistaken for copperheads, or not, not copperheads, cottonmouths, which are not found in Ohio. Another one is the, the eastern hognose snake. Um, because they kind of have a similar appearance, um, they can kind of have that dark body with the, the blotching. They can sometimes be confused for a rattlesnake. Um, and they flatten, they can flatten their, their hood out. And so people sometimes will think they might be a type of cobra or something like that. That's all a ruse just to try to scare you, uh, to make you leave them alone because they feel you're threatening them in some way. But uh, obviously, you can see them in all these pictures, that upturned nose of theirs, uh, that snout is a good giveaway, um, as well as their pupils, um, and the fact that, you know, once, you know, there's, there's no, you know, once you kind of get, if you get too close to them and, and they feel agitated enough, they'll, they'll start in that theatrics that, uh, where they'll play dead. And there's no other snake in Ohio that, that'll do that. Some of them might, some of some of our woodland species might, uh, they feel threatened. They might wrap, shake their tail, um, and some people think that that might mean it's like a, a little a little rattlesnake or something like that. And that's not it at all. Uh, but they are trying to mimic a rattlesnake. So if you think about where a lot of these snakes are found, they're found in the woods, down in the leaf litter. And if they were shaking their tail like that in the leaves, it would almost sound like a rattle. And so they're trying to mimic a rattlesnake to try to uh, fend off a would-be predator. So those two snakes are always confused with this guy. <clears throat> and I always have to tell people this. Uh, cotton mouths or water moccasins are not found in Ohio. Unless somebody brought one from down south and released it up here during the summertime, uh, it would not survive the winter. They wouldn't survive. They wouldn't know what to do with, with our winters here in Ohio. They would, they would perish. Um, they're really found down uh, down in the southeast part of the United States. They like warm, uh, you know, humid, semi-tropical weather. They like marshes and bogs, uh, coastal floodplains, things like that. Uh, that's their kind of preferred habitat. Um, but you do see these guys have a very similar color pattern to the northern water snake. Uh, they do have a similar color pattern to the, um, the hog nose snake as well. Um, but you don't have to worry about them here in Ohio. Now, if you do go down to the southeast, um, you know, they are down there. Um, they are something to be, to be mindful of. But um, unless you're really traipsing around the, the bogs and the marshes down there, you don't have to, don't have to worry about them too much. Um, 
as evidence in a couple of these pictures, they get their main cotton mouth and that white mouth that they display. Um, that's almost like their, their rattle. Um, that's their display when they're saying, all right, I feel threatened, you need to back away, you need to leave me alone. Uh, and that's a good indication that you should probably just you know, be on your way. Uh, or, or you should at least give them some space. Um, snakes are snakes are typically uh, uh, you know they they're typically are cowards first. A good a common quote that is is often is, is said is snakes are first cowards, second bluffers, and lastly warriors. So they go through kind of three stages. You know when they encounter something that they're afraid of, i.e. people, because people are all bigger than them. They all see they see us as 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 threats, as predators. They think that we're out to eat them and kill them. And so at, for the first thing they want to do is just get away from us. They want to try to sneak away as quietly as they can. They're cowards. They don't they don't want to fight. Um, but if they get cornered or they feel like we're too close or we are, you know, they don't have a way out, uh, that's when they'll start bluffing. That's when they'll rattle their tail and try to rattle their tail in the leaves or if they're a rattlesnake they actually have the rattle or in the cotton mouse case you know they'll curl up and they'll show that white mouth um, you know these are all defense mechanisms defense postures that say whoa buddy like you need to back up uh, and and lastly you know they will you know if they if, if none of that works they will put up a fight um, and you never want to push a snake especially a venomous one that far um, no, typically, um, majority of, of venomous snake bites are what we call dry bites, uh, where the venom isn't even injected. Um, venom is actually an incredible resource uh, for these snakes um, to get food and to feed themselves. And it actually takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to make it. Um, and so the snake is aware of that and it doesn't want to expend its valuable venom its precious resource on trying to defend itself or trying to you know scare off a predator which it sees us as um, that's not what it wants to use its venom on it wants to use its venom on something that it can eat to sustain itself and uh, otherwise it has to wait uh, until it can make more venom before it can eat again um, so you know it's almost you know it's almost uh, in, in their interest to conserve their venom and, and not use it. So um, as, as many or as much as common misconceptions and, and things like that are out there about especially venomous snakes, um, they're not out to get us. Uh, they're, they're not trying to chase us down and, and bite us. They're not trying to kill us. Um, that's, that's really not what they're, they're trying to do at all. They're just trying to to get away from us and, and to, to live and, and see and uh, eat another day. Uh, just, just kind of wrapping up on the, the cotton mouth, uh, as I said before, you know, they're not found in Ohio, they're found kind of down in the southeast, um, stretching up to, to Missouri, the very southern tip of Illinois, a um, couple little spots there in Indiana, but I mean, that's about as close as they get to Ohio, and then they'll stretch up the Atlantic coast there. Where they like those kind of uh, cypress bogs, uh, marshes, and things like that, and that's where they hunt fish and uh, frogs and, and crayfish and things like that. They're a very aquatic species. Um, but kind of going over a little bit, uh, I know I, I already talked about it a little bit, but I'm just kind of wrapping up on the venomous species. Um, you know, never, never mess with or pick up or handle a snake unless you're absolutely sure of its ID, uh, because you never know. Um, so maintaining and observing a, a safe distance is always the, the best way to ensure everybody's safety, uh, yourselves and the snakes. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, a lot of you know snakes are our last warriors. So I mean. Uh, typically, the last last line of defense, uh, the you know majority of, of snake bites that it have an envenomation, where the snake injects venom, is when people are trying to kill them, uh, or pick them up, or harass them. Um, usually, they're not uh, just out to get us. They're not trying to to hurt us or anything like that. Um, 
as I said, you know, as I said on the last, you know, slide, making venom is a is a very intensive process. Um, it can take, you know, depending on the snake, it can take up to to two weeks to to replenish um, where it can't get food then, because that's its its primary way of getting food. Um, the the diagram on the right there is a, a little bit of a helpful hand. I kind of uh, talked about it earlier when we were differentiating some some harmless species versus venomous species. Um, those pupils, the rounded pupils versus the, the vertical pupils, um, the, the heat sensing pits in the front of the pit viper's uh, nose. Um, and you can see where, you can see on the head how it has that wide, um, right like behind the eyes, how it gets real wide there. That's where the venom glands are, and so it's a lot wider there on a venomous species than it is on a non-venomous species. The non-venomous species, the head, uh, basically after it gets past the, the back of the head, yeah, I mean, it's almost it's the same width as the body. Um, you really can't tell a huge difference there. And again, uh, some of those characteristics are not always um, good for identifying uh, venomous versus non-venomous in other parts of the world. Uh, but here in Ohio, it, it's safe. <clears throat> and kind of uh, talking a little bit here, wrapping up, um, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that a lot of people's uh, fears of snakes are, are kind of like not really rational. Um, mostly it's just a, um, kind of an innate thing. And, and you know, it, it's, it's an evolutionary thing. You know, it behooves us to be it behooved our ancestors to be afraid of snakes, uh, all snakes, but then, you know, just to save ourselves from the venomous ones. Um, but in reality, venomous species make up a very small percentage of, of the total number of snakes. Um, they're actually relatively rare. Uh, and as you can see by this graph here, the annual number of fatalities in the United States um, from different things. Um, snakes are all the way down there um, at six, uh, which is Right around the same as spiders, less than dogs, cows, or wasps, or hornets, or even lightning strikes. Um, so wrapping up here, um, snakes and you. Uh, as I said, you know, snakes play an incredibly important role in our ecosystems. Um, you know, they help manage populations of of um, insects as well as rodents and things like that. They help keep those populations in control. Um, they can actually reduce the amount of ticks and, and pests and things like that in the environment by consuming the rodents um, because rodents are such a big vector for ticks. Um, when the snake eats the rodent, they eat the ticks. And um, they also reduce garden pests such as slugs um, and, and things like that, the smaller snakes do. So they're actually really nice to have around the garden, around your barn. Um, because they do play such a big role in the environment. And, and as I said, you know, they are prey for, uh, for uh, animals that are further up the food chain, like hawks and foxes and coyotes and bobcats. Uh, uh, another really big and, and kind of fascinating uh, feature about the venomous species in, in particular is that venom is used uh, extensively in the medical bio, bioengineering field. Um, that venom is actually used uh, in medicine quite a bit, a lot more than many people realize. And it's used to uh, help make various kind of medications for people with illnesses, um, help make drugs uh, and things like that. Um, the actual you know, study of, of toxicology and, and the study of, of studying venom and its properties and things like that um, is actually a pretty big um, field and um, it's pretty important and, and has led to the creation of some, some life-saving um, medicines and, and things like that for people. With that, that's all I have. Um, appreciate your time. And uh, as I said, you know, you can, my name is Brian. Uh, I work uh, up, in, up in Knox County in Mount Vernon uh, for the, the Knox SWCD. Um, and my email is down there. Uh, feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions or comments or anything like that. Um, that that's uh, about all I have. Take care, everyone.